Good afternoon, everyone. I'm April Cheek Messier. I'm president of the National D-Day Memorial Foundation. I'm so happy to be here today to share a very important story with you. And by the way, we have these Lunchbox lectures. I hope you can check out our Facebook page, our website, YouTube channel to see any of these lectures at any time. Uh, we encourage you uh, to do that. So I am going to be talking about the story of the 6888th Central Postal Directory Battalion, which is a fascinating story uh, about a group of African-American women. Uh, these, they were part of the Women's Army Corps and they were the only African-American women with the Army's Women's Army Corps to go overseas during World War II. So I'm gonna bring up a couple of slides and share this impressive story with you today. And I have to tell you that the first time I heard about the 6 triple eight was 17 years ago. So I'm gonna date myself a little bit here. 17 years ago, I was doing some research. Uh, at that time, I was the director of education and here at the Memorial, and I was looking for some lecture topics and somehow or another stumbled across this little known story of the 6 8 I had never heard the story before and was really fascinated uh, to know more. And I found out there was a book actually that was written about uh, these women and um, really couldn't find a lot of other information. But uh, the book was written by Brenda Moore, and she actually wrote this book called To Serve My Country, To Serve My Race. And it's the story of the only African-American wax stationed overseas in World War II. I reached out to her because I really wanted to get her here to the memorial to tell this story. And she very graciously did so. And we actually even partnered with a local university here. Uh, it was a college then, Hollins College, now a university. And she came and she spoke. And it was, I found it just absolutely fascinating. Now, since that time, a lot more information has come out about the six triple eight and who they were, who these incredible women were, what the, what the job that they did, and uh, certainly why it's so important for us to remember them. There's been a lot of articles and a couple, uh, I think a documentary now about the six triple eight, as well as a uh, monument. And that monument is fairly new, it was dedicated November 30th and 2000. 2018 at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And here you see it's a very detailed monument telling their story. On top of it, you see their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams. And I'll be telling her story uh, more in just a little bit. So they've certainly garnered a lot more attention over the years, but for so long, uh, their achievements were hidden from history. And today I'm just going to touch on a few highlights because I think, again, it's such an incredible story that many people still, even with the attention that they've received of late, have uh, or just are not aware of. And by the way, there is a Congressional Gold Medal effort underway uh, for the 6 8 and I'll share more about that at the uh, end as well. And I'm going to tell the story a little backwards today because I really want to dive into what did the 6 8 do? What, uh, what were their achievements uh, during World War II? And then we'll kind of, uh, uh, I'll show how they got there, how the 6 8 came to be. But it's a very unique story. And part of the reason it's so unique is because these women were fighting on several fronts during World War II. Obviously, they were fighting gender bias. This was the 1940s, it was, the, it was World War II, and women really had to prove themselves, uh, obviously, uh, at the time, there was this perception that women could not achieve the same things as men. Uh, in the defense industry, for example, there was a lot of pushback on whether or not women could do the same jobs that men can do, who had uh, obviously had left those jobs to fight in the war. Uh, so they really, in that sense, had to prove themselves uh, as women. But they were also fighting racial bias as well. And obviously during World War II, this was uh, the Jim Crow era, and they were up against uh, very difficult conditions um, as women trying to prove themselves, but also as black women trying to show that they were very capable and they were fighting those racial stereotypes at the time. It was, again, a segregated America, uh, 1940s, and really a country of contradictions uh, at that time, which resulted in the Double V Campaign, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and uh, was really brought to the forefront by the Pittsburgh Courier. This was the largest African-American newspaper during World War II. And the Double V Campaign really started with uh, an article that was written by James G. Thompson, who uh, wrote this, he was a young man who wrote this ed editorial that really sparked the idea of victory at home, victory abroad. Uh, African-Americans were serving 
uh, they, they had become very vocal with the fact that they were they had one million um, African American men and women serving in World War II. There were another six million who were working in the defense industry, and it just meant that Jim Crow could no longer go unchallenged. Something had to be done. And so World War II really was a turning point because you're going to see the early seeds of uh, you know, the feminist movement, uh, of women's rights, of civil rights. And we see that as, as women step out and, and do these jobs and prove themselves, um, as well as uh, African-American men and women who were showing that they, they can do this. And a lot of opportunities uh, came available to them to be able to prove themselves, but that was hard. They had to fight for them. Uh, generally, Black women were the last to be hired in the defense industry, for example. Uh, the pattern generally went that you would have older white men hired, then unmarried white women, uh, married white women, black men, and then uh, black women. It was very hard for them to get um, these jobs, which uh, were certainly very, very important. And oftentimes they were relegated to janitorial positions or uh, cafeteria positions and things like that. The women who became part of the 6888 certainly understood that joining the military and taking part in these opportunities, uh, joining the Women's Army Corps, for example, was going to give them a lot of new opportunities that they may not have. And we're going to really look at what was it specifically that they did. And we'll talk about how they uh, entered um, the Women's Army Corps in just a little bit. But let's talk about what happened to the 6888 and, and the job that they did. Remember that this is 855 African-American women who are going to, they're part of the Women's Army Corps. They have been assigned to the 6 triple eight. This is their unit, and they're going to serve overseas in World War II. Now, this is, again, the only black unit of the Women's Army Corps to serve overseas in World War II. And they had a momentous task. They had a task that a lot of other people had already failed at, and it was handed to them. And that was to clear the backlog of mail that accumulated in the European Theater of Operations uh, and they needed to get that mail delivered. Now, we're talking about a two to three year backlog of mail, if you can imagine that. And if you see this picture here, that gives you some sense that when they arrived, they were looking at about three airplane hangars full of mail, stacked floor to ceiling. And we're talking packages that had set for several years that had food in it, for example, rotting food. You can imagine the rats and the mice scurrying across these uh, hangers as they had destroyed many of the packages, eaten, consumed a lot of the food. Uh, this was uh, really a, a, a tragedy in the, in the respect that you know, soldiers were not getting these packages. They were not getting the mail. And that was devastating. It was devastating for troop morale. Uh, everyone understood. The military had a very keen understanding that troops not getting mail was devastating. Uh, try to put yourself in the place of someone serving overseas in World War II. It's not like today we have all that instant communication, but in World War II, you are anxiously waiting from those letters from your loved ones. And months go by, a year goes by, more than a year goes by, and you have not received a single letter from home. And you're wondering, what's happening at home? How are my loved ones? You can't stay focused. How in the world can you do your job and stay focused if you don't even know what's happening at home? It poses a real problem. And the military understood that. And that's where the 6 triple eight is going to come in, and they have to fix this problem. And by the way, veterans will often tell you that the most important thing to them, hands down, aside from food, and oftentimes they would put mail above for food, it was mail. It was getting mail from home. So again, it was really, really critical. So the sheer volume of this mail is mind-boggling. If you think about this for just a moment. There were uh, the 1945 annual report to the Postmaster General said that 2.5 billion pieces of mail were circulated in the U.S. Army just in that year alone, in 1945, 2.5 billion pieces. The year prior to that, 1944, it was 1.4 billion. So there's even more mail uh, circulating in 1945 than the year prior. The problem is it's getting stuck. It's not getting where it needs to be. People are writing. Loved ones are sending their letters. They're using V-mail. And you can see from these propaganda posters at the time, you know, be with him at every mail call. Uh, you know, these were really, they were encouraging everyone to make sure that they're writing and they're writing every day to their loved ones, but it's not getting where it needs to go. And again, that is a problem. So the women of the 6 triple eight come in and they devise a plan. How are they going to decrease this backlog and get it out there quickly? They were given six months 
by the U.S. Army to get their job done, six months to take care of this backlog. Now, keep in mind that you have a lot of issues with the mail uh, at the time. You've got a, um, troops that are in a combat zone and they're constantly moving. How do you even know where they are at any given time? You have to locate where they are, these individual troops. They have index cards for every soldier and they're trying to locate them um, and figure out uh, you know, exactly where they are at any given moment. There's 7 million military personnel and civilians from the United States in the ETO, the Eastern European Theater of Operations at the time. 7 million. And guess what? A lot of them have the same names. <laughs> so the add, add to that problem that a lot of people also, a lot of family members, didn't really uh, know how to address letters properly. So some of the letters would be illegible. Uh, some of the uh, family members or, or loved ones would write, you know, their nicknames to Johnny, U.S. Army. Okay, how do we find Johnny in the U.S. Army in the European Theater of Operations? It's not going to be easy. Um, how many Robert Smiths do you think are serving in the Eastern Theater of Operations in World War II? Turns out a lot. 7,500 Robert Smiths uh, serving in the European Theater. How do you find the right Robert? You know, a lot of them use nicknames, you know, to Buster. Oh, well, who's Buster? You know, so they had to figure out. They had to find their serial numbers. They had to uh, really do a lot, look at a lot of clues to try to find to locate these soldiers. But, and they became really invested in this pro process. Um, they became very connected to the men that they were trying to find. Um, here's a great quote. Uh, this is Private First uh, Class Dorothy Turner. And she said, you could see the last time that this man got mail. You had this pile of mail that he should have gotten over the years. You knew that he had not gotten any news from his family or friends, and you were determined to try to find him. So this really was an emotional journey for these women to try to, uh, you know, a personal mission to try to locate these men so that they could uh, get these ma this mail that was uh, due to them. Others were very saddened to find that some men on their rosters who would never, you know, that they found out they would never receive their mail. You can see the stacks of mail here in front of Corporal Alice uh, Dixon. And she said the wives and sweethearts would write every day. So we had stacks of mail to send back deceased, where they had to mark those letters deceased. And those are soldiers that would have never seen any of those letters that were meant for them. And that was heartbreaking to these women. Um, you know, they, they really tried very hard to make sure they could get this mail out quickly. They were charged with putting packages back together. I mentioned all of the rats scurrying around in the airplane hangars and food that had been consumed already. Uh, you know, so putting together packages and salvaging what they could was very important. Uh, there were women who were charged with, um, you know, going in and, and, and trying to, again, repair all those packages. And uh, there was a, there's an author, Mary Farrell, who wrote Standing Up Against Hate, and she said the women had to wear water-repellent clothes and boots to protect themselves from rotting food and mice droppings, and they tried to go through and salvage what they could, such as socks, jewelry, photographs, anything like that, and again, repackage that, put it in the correct package, and make it look as, as normal as they could. Uh, that was important work. And by the way, this is uh, Alice Dixon, who lived to be 108 years old. She died, um, I believe, in 2016 there. So um, amazing women. And really, when you think about what they're doing, they're kind of forensic investigators in a way. You know, they're looking for all these clues. They're trying to get this mail out. Uh, they track down serial numbers. This was, again, not an easy task. And they worked around the clock, seven days a week. 24-hour shifts, and they would break into three shifts each day, and they would rotate those shifts. But it's truly mar remarkable what they were able to do, because they were able to clear this backlog, not in six months, as the Army had uh, ordered them to do, but in three months, in half the time. And that means they process 65,000 pieces of mail per shift, that's every eight hours, or 195,000 pieces every 24 hours. And if that's not challenging enough, you see from this photograph, uh, the conditions that they worked in were extraordinarily difficult. You can see here very crowded conditions. Uh, there's very poor lighting. Remember, this is England. They were in Birmingham, England at the time. Uh, you had blackout conditions. So you can see uh, you know, blackout curtains. They could not let any chink of light show through for fear of uh, bombing. Um, and so they, they lived in pretty difficult conditions. There was no heat. Uh, so, you know, you're freezing half the time that you're working. They would often layer their clothing, wear field jackets, ski pants to stay warm. 
Um, and on top of all of that, they also had to censor the mail. So not only are you trying to locate the soldiers, but you have to go through and censor the mail at the same time. So it was extraordinary time consuming. This was, again, uh, a big task. Their motto was no male, low morale. And they always kept that in their mind, that they knew that it, what they were doing was having a direct mm -hmm. impact on the morale of the troops. Again, a monumental task. They had a lot of responsibility. And they always got a great deal of satisfaction um, when they heard from some uh, of the servicemen or the officers who really thanked them for getting these packages out and when they would arrive. So uh, that meant a great deal to them. So they would clear the backlog in England and then they would be um, sent to Rouen, France. And it was, really in, it was really there that they began to see the destruction of war. And that was really an eye opener for them. They, uh, here you see a picture of them working along French civilians. Uh, at the time, which uh, they did do, but they, they saw bombed out buildings. They really saw the destruction of war at that point. Um, and they did the same job there, working in those uh, same 24-hour uh, shifts. They cleared the backlog in three months, and then they were sent to Paris, and they would do it all again. They were extraordinarily successful as they as they did their work, and they they also they worked very 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 hard. But they really enjoyed their time overseas, and part of that is because they they were treated so well. Uh, the British, uh, the French, uh, really took to the women. Uh, they enjoy talking to them. They invited them into their homes. Uh, one of the um, women who's was a uh, who served in the six triple eight she said that at fort or oglethorpe which was where they did their training we were just plain scared to even venture off the post but in england we were treated like kings and queens uh, so when they were in england again uh, they became uh, they struck up friendships uh, with a lot of the uh, locals here you see a great picture of them in birmingham england um, uh, they were invited to you know dinners and tea and uh, they thoroughly enjoyed their time there. They felt very welcome. So when they were overseas, they didn't feel the racism that they had encountered in the United States. And the only time they really did encounter racism uh, was from Americans who were serving overseas. And a great example of that is the um, American Red Cross in England had actually set up segregated facilities for black and white wax, and as, um, as well as recreational, separate recreational facilities. And the battalion commander, Charity Adams at the time, you know, told her, uh, told the women, do not uh, go to those facilities. I would, you know, refuse to go to those segregated clubs. And they did. Every single woman of the 6th Eighth refused to use those segregated facilities because they really felt like um, it should not be segregated, uh, that they were all in this together, they were serving together, and it there, there should not be any segregation. So again, those are one of those moments where you start to see the seeds of uh, the civil rights movement here growing, and that's very important. Uh, this battalion, again, was unique in that it was segregated by race. It was segregated by gender. They had full responsibility as a six uh, eight for, for carrying out their affairs, achieving their mission. Uh, I love that Charity Adams, who wanted to keep morale up, made sure that the women had everything they needed, including a beauty parlor. I love this. So it was very important to the women and to keep their morale up. Uh, she made sure that they had recreational activities. Uh, there were a lot of, they formed their own baseball team, for example. They had their own basketball team. They were actually in tournaments in Europe. Uh, in fact, they won a uh, the ETO championship, basketball uh, championship in Europe at the time. Um, volleyball, ping pong, things like that. Anything to help uh, from a recreational standpoint that would keep uh, their um, morale up. Uh, you know, they had a dance group, they had a band, things like that. And they traveled throughout Europe. And travel became something that all the ladies uh, post-war would talk about how much that meant uh, to them. I love this uh, photograph here of a friendly snowball fight in Europe in 1945. You can see they're really enjoying themselves. And again, there was a strong sense of camaraderie uh, with the women of the 6th Triple Eight. They, they had gone through some very tough times together, um, experienced a lot together, and that was a bond that would last throughout their lifetimes. Um, you know, they had, again, some wonderful moments together. Um, and they also had some pretty scary, frightening moments, too. I should mention that when they first went overseas, there were um, uh, several waves of the 6 triple as they came over. And one was on the uh, Ile de France, which was a luxury liner. Uh, 
uh, that had been converted, obviously, for carrying troops over. And while they were headed over, um, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean, they were chased by a German submarine who was trying to torpedo the ship. And some of those women on board uh, with the six triplets can distinctly remember thinking they were going to die because the ship was zigzagging so uh, so much that uh, you know everything you can imagine is falling off of the uh, shelves and there's alarms and whistles going off and it was a very scary time. That was really the first uh, inclination for many of these women what they were getting themselves into uh, that this was very dangerous in fact and uh, when many of them arrived um, they uh, were greeted with V1 rockets uh, that one of, some of them uh, immediately upon arriving had to take cover and something that they all vividly remember as well. There was also a tragedy uh, while they were in France uh, serving in France uh, there were three women of the 6th Triple Eighth who were killed in a Jeep accident. And um, that was, again, a really uh, devastating uh, thing for the women who were all very, very uh, close. But here you can see um, uh, the three, three women who were killed, their names here. And by the way, this photo is not uh, uh, of the women who were killed, but it does show the type of Jeep um, that they would have been in. And you can see the cross there to Mary Barlow. Uh, killed uh, July 8th, 1945. And what's really remarkable is that these, uh, the women of the 6th Triple Eighth all came together and they raised money for their memorial services. Uh, they, uh, you know, made sure they purchased their caskets. Uh, they did everything they could to make sure these women had a very appropriate service and they were buried with honors and they're actually buried in the Normandy American Cemetery. In fact, there are only four women buried in the Normandy American Cemetery in France, and three of them are with the 6th Triple Eighth, um, as you see there. So, um, so that was certainly a difficult time for them. But I think aside from the, the tragedy and some of the, the uh, difficult conditions that they worked in, the one thing that I think made the 6th Triple Eighth so successful and the reason that the women really had such good experiences is because of their commanding officer, Charity Adams. I cannot say enough about her and what she was able to do. She was an exceptional leader by all accounts. Uh, you know, keep in mind that, again, this company, it's a company of commissioned and non-commissioned officers who were all African-American women. And so they really had that bond and Charity Adams really had this responsiveness to the needs of um, these women. And she was a great role, role model. She had a uh, college degree uh, with majors in uh, mathematics, physics, Latin, a minor in history. And this was this was before she entered the service. Um, and by the way, she would become the highest ranking African-American um, WAC uh, at that time that you could, you could, she achieved um, the highest rank you could achieve, which was Lieutenant Colonel. Um, but she was born in 1919 in Columbia, South Carolina. Her father was a minister, her mother a teacher. They had very high expectations uh, for their children. They had four children. Uh, so she was a valedictorian of her high school class. She graduated high school when she was just 16 years old. Uh, she graduated from Wilberforce College in 1938, and she taught school in Columbia while um, she was working on her master's degree at Ohio State. But it was in 1942 that she learned that the dean of her alma mater had recommended her into the first class, officer class, uh, for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which would later become the Women's Army Corps. And she was just 23 years old at the time. Uh, her parents weren't really thrilled for her to do that, but she felt it was definitely a way that she could have uh, some new opportunities. She was very excited about it. And uh, she quickly moved up in rank, as you can see. She was promoted to major in September 1944. And in November 1944, she learned that she's going to go to the US Army's Command and General Staff School. Uh, they were opening it up for the first time to uh, the Women's Army Corps. Um, uh, and so uh, for them to uh, train as officers. And she was very excited that, looking forward to that. However, before she could do that, she received orders that she would not be going to Fort Leavenworth, but instead she would be going overseas. And she would not know exactly why she was going overseas until she was on a crowded cargo plane headed uh, to London. And she had her orders sitting on her lap, very nervous as you can imagine, and she unseals her envelope she, um, and was absolutely stunned to see that she was going to be commanding um, this six triple eight, uh, this group of women. So it was uh, really, and she was over the moon. Uh, that, you know, what an opportunity, she thought to herself, that she's going to be commanding a battalion overseas during wartime. What a fantastic opportunity. So she was thrilled with that. Her only concern, of course, was 
you know, this monumental task that was before them. Uh, she lined her troops up immediately. And she said, and, and you can imagine being uh, part of this group as you're looking at this backlog of mail, again, stacked floor to ceiling. And she says, I know how this looks, ladies. And I know what you're probably thinking, but we have a job to do and we're going to get it done. But now let's get organized. And that's what she, that's what she did. Um, so the ladies had a tremendous respect for Charity Adams. They nicknamed her Big Ma because she really looked after them. Uh, and my favorite story about her actually concerns a altercation she had with a white male general during her time there. He had come to inspect the troops and she, would, she never mentioned the name of who this general was, but she does talk about this story um, in her memoir. But she said and it was March of 1945 and he came to examine the battalion and he goes and he looks at the barracks um, and uh, the, the work areas and he goes out to inspect the women who are in formation and realizes that not all the women are in formation and he becomes very angry at this and Charity Adams uh, looks and he looks the, the general looks at her and very sternly says Adams where are the other personnel of your unit and uh, she at attention says uh, you know, yes, sir, we work eight hour shifts. So some of the women are working and another uh, group of women are sleeping. Well, he did not like that answer at all. Um, and so he looked at her and he said, I am going to send a white first lieutenant down here to show you how to run this unit. And she looked at him with really probably without even a moment's uh, notice and said, over my dead body, sir. <laughs> and so, uh, th th and that, that was extraordinarily bold because she, very easily could have been court-martialed uh, for that. Uh, and, and he was taken aback and he replied, you'll be hearing from me. And she said, and I'll file, I'll file charges against you for using segregationist language. That's a violation of Allied directives. So she was very quick on her feet. He left without a word. And she felt very strongly. These were her ladies. She was in charge of them and she knew that they needed to rest to get their job done. She wasn't gonna have all of them lined up in formation when they didn't need to be. And that, that's how she felt. Um, now, I will say that she was not court-martialed over this, and sometime later, this same white general came to visit her. He was actually getting ready to rotate uh, back to the United States, and he came to her, and he said, Adams, working with you has been quite an education for me. It's been a long time since anyone challenged me, black or white, but you took me on. You outsmarted me, and I'm proud that I know you. So I think that was a, just a, a great moment uh, there and really shows that, you know, Terry Adams never backed down uh, from anything. And she would, again, become the highest ranking African-American woman um, in the Army and receiving uh, the rank of lieutenant colonel in just four years. Again, pretty incredible. Um, now, we're going to be running out of time here. So I just want to very quickly run through a couple of things, which is how did the women of the 6th Triple Eighth you know, how did they get there? Uh, because we know what they did, we know what their achievements were, which were, again, pretty remarkable. But how did they actually get there? And just as a quick reminder, uh, during World War II, there were approximately 350,000 women who served in the military uh, in World War II. The large majority of them served in the Women's Army Corps, as you can see, about 150,000. Obviously, there were women in the Armed Nurse Corps, the WAVES, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, under the SPAR uh, group. Uh, the Marine Corps Women's Reserve had about 23,000 uh, women in that, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, um, as well as the Navy Nurse Corps. Now, there were not a lot of African-American women who served, and some were not even allowed in some of um, these military branches. Um, but the WACs uh, did have a fair number of um, African-American women who signed up and who were part of that, although there was a quota uh, because of the time and being in segregated America, there was a quota on that. And how did the WAC unit itself come to be? Uh, this was a bill that was introduced in 1941 uh, by U.S. Representative Edith Norse. Uh, it was created in, officially created in May 1942, but it was initially called the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And so it was created with no military status at that time. Um, but uh, once it was established, black women began to be recruited. They would spend about four to six weeks in basic training in Fort Des Moines, uh, Iowa. And it was July of 1943, actually, when General Eisenhower asked for women to be sent to um, post headquarters in North Africa. But auxiliaries were not allowed to be sent overseas. 
and that's when a bill was passed to ma basically make the um, the auxiliary non-existent, but to make this part of the U.S. Army officially, so they would would, would receive military status, and that's how the wax was formed. Now, I do want to very quickly mention one very important person who helped make sure that black women became part of the Women's Army Corps, and that's Mary McLeod Bethune. And here you see a wonderful picture with her with Eleanor Roosevelt in 1939. I could do an entire program just on Mary McLeod Bethune, who were just an extraordinary woman who was absolutely instrumental in getting women as part of the Army Corps. Uh, but she was an advisor to uh, Roosevelt, uh, to both Eleanor Roosevelt and her husband, President Roosevelt, and she played a very key role in shaping government policies for African Americans in the 30s and the 40s. Um, and she actually served on Roosevelt's cabinet, and she founded the National Council of Negro Women in 1935. She did so much, and she really successfully pushed Roosevelt um, when the Women's Army Corps was created to make sure that uh, not only were black women um, accepted into this, but there would also be officers, uh, black women officers as well. Uh, she also did a lot in the defense industry, by the way, to help desegregate, um, uh, you know, make sure there were policies in, with employers during World War II to make sure uh, there were fair hiring practices and things like that. So she did an amazing amount of work. And she's really the person people would go to when um, uh, young women were exp experiencing problems with trying to sign up, for example, in the Women's Army Corps, um, she received a lot of uh, correspondence from those women uh, to say, can you do something? And they did face a lot of discrimination. A lot of young black women who tried to um, join the Women's Army Corps, for example, were turned down. Uh, you know, a lot of times there were a lot of excuses made on why they weren't accepted or why they weren't given, uh, you know, the proper information to sign up. And so all of this information would oftentimes go to Mary McLeod uh, Bethune, who would really rally to support them. Uh, once women were accepted uh, into the Women's Army Corps, they were basically um, looked at in as, as terms of their skill set. You know, where should they go, whether they would, you know, perhaps be physical therapists, medical technicians, code breakers, um, mechanics. You know, they really were, it was determined, you know, where should they be sent. Now, for a lot of young black women, however, uh, they did, uh, there was a lot of discriminatory practices on um, sending them to jobs that did not pair well with their skills. And usually the jobs they were often assigned were the, uh, probably the worst jobs, and they weren't ones that really uh, had anything to do with their skill set. And you had women like, uh, for example, young whack Alice Young, who said that she was a medical technician. She was working in a hospital, taking temperature of patients, checking on patients and things like that. When the commander of the hospital saw her, and it said essentially that black wax were to scrub floors, wash dishes, and do all the dirty work. And she was immediately demoted. Um, and so a lot of um, black wax during the time actually went on strike. And they, uh, again, they could have been court-martialed for this, but they went forward and they said, this is not right. Uh, we, have, we have diverse skills and talents and we're not being utilized and it's, that's, that's unfair. And so, um, again, a lot of women really um, uh, you know, pushed back against that. Um, there were also cases, unfortunately, where women were um, targeted uh, with violence. Um, and, and, and I'm showing you all this to show that getting to the 6th Triple Eighth was not an easy process. You know, this certainly took a lot of courage for these young women to sign up, to go through uh, the training, to do everything that needed to be done. Uh, it was not as simple as just, uh, you know, joining training and going overseas. A lot of them um, certainly had uh, you know, some pretty horrifying experiences. Um, this actually is a um, newspaper article, uh, December 1944. I, this was the case of um, several WACs who were Private Gladys um, Blackman and Private Roberta McKenzie, who December 23rd, 1944, um, a white policeman actually beat them and arrested them for refusing to give up their seats to whites. And uh, they were seated actually in the back of the bus in the in an area designated for uh, blacks. However, the bus filled up and um, the driver asked them to move and they refused. And so this police officer uh, proceeds to drag them off the bus. So it was pretty horrifying. Um, and, you know, the, it, it ended up that um, I believe it was Gladys Blackman was beaten pretty severely, spent a week in the hospital. Um, and so they was pretty terrifying, some of these experiences that they had. Another incident in July of 1945 with Helen Smith of Syracuse, New York. Um, she was with, there were basically three African-American 
uh, members of the Women's Army Corps who were ble beaten by police officers while they were sitting in the waiting room at a Greyhound bus station um, because they apparently were not in the correct waiting room. And so one of the women, it's Helen Smith you see here, was taken to jail. She was le released a few hours later, but she'd been beaten pretty severely, um, two black eyes, a tooth nearly knocked out. And sadly, when they got back to the post at Fort Knox, uh, they were reprimanded by their post commander for not obeying Jim Crow laws. Uh, and they were court-martialed. However, later those charges would be dropped. So, you know, these women uh, and their experiences, certainly they carried with them um, as wax and as women who eventually joined uh, the 6th Triple Eighth, because women of the 6th Triple Eighth knew these stories. Um, and I think they had to be incredibly brave to uh, come forward and stand up to uh, the, uh, you know, the racial attitudes uh, at the time, and I, and it really had an impact on them uh, throughout the war. You know, they went overseas. They um, they understood that what they did mattered, that their service mattered, and they felt very uh, strongly that this could change perceptions. And and serving overseas really reaffirmed to them as well this belief that there could be a country of racial equality, you know, serving in Britain, serving in France, where they, they did not see the racial tensions that they saw in the United States, had such an impact on these women. And again, would really, I think, sow the seeds of the early civil rights movement for them, where they would come back and challenge those stereotypes. They challenged it during World War II, and they were going to challenge it afterwards as well. Um, so I think that's important to note. Uh, finally, what happened to Charity Adams and some of the women from the 6 Triple Eighth? Um, you know, many of the women came back. They were thrilled with their experiences. Uh, they had been able to travel. They uh, had this bond for life with one another. And because they were now able to get the GI Bill, now a lot of these women had college degrees before they entered the Women's Army Corps, but quite a few did not. And when they came back, they used the GI Bill to go to college. And so quite a few women talked about when they came back having a lot more opportunities available to them, not only because they were veterans, but because they were able to use the GI Bill and go to school and really uh, attain a really relatively high status position in uh, the civilian labor market because of their experiences. Um, so I think uh, overall very positive experiences for the women. And Charity Adams um, would come back and she earned a master's degree in psychology from Ohio State University. Uh, she worked in various jobs afterwards, the Veterans Administration, for example, in Ohio and um, and several colleges and then ended up um, in 1945 getting, uh, I'm sorry, 1949, she got married. She moved to Switzerland for a time because uh, her husband was completing medical school and then they returned to the United States in 1952, settled in Ohio and had two children. Uh, she died sadly in 2002 uh, at the age of 83. And I want to share one more thing here and this is a telegram that was from Mary McLeod Bethune, which demonstrates I, I think the fact that these women, um, you know, you see in her uh, message here um, to all of the six year boy, this was right before they deployed, by the way, it was right before they went overseas, is realize your individual responsibility. Carve a niche for those who will follow you. Um, she was so proud of these women and she, she knew and the women knew what was at stake and they certainly did pave the way. They opened many, many doors that had been closed. They broke down incredible barriers and they made the country proud. They made it a significant difference. There is a Congressional Medal of Honor effort out uh, right now uh, for these women. Um, and, you know, they, in 2019, were, they were awarded the Meritus Unit Citation by the Secretary of the Army, but this is something that uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor, I think, would be very, very important to, uh, as a unit uh, for what they did, and mainly because so many of their sacrifices, too, were never acknowledged, um, and not acknowledged, really, until the last few years. So I think this is uh, very important, and I, you can learn more about, uh, about this effort by going to the Women in the 6 Triple Eight. You see the um, web address there at the bottom of the page. It's also a wonderful website for additional information on the women and uh, some great videos of uh, their accomplishments. So I encourage you to visit that. And I am out of time. So I am now going to see um, just what kind of questions we have here. It looks like we have a number of
comments. Uh, here's one. Are there any veterans of the 6888th still living? Great question. Uh, there are six, as of the end of December 2021, there are still six women alive with the 6 triple eight. So um, that's why this Congressional Medal of Honor effort, I think, becomes even more important. Uh, while several of the women are still with us, we need to, uh, to get this done. Um, what happened when a letter arrived in Europe for a man who had already been killed in action? I think just like all of the letters, it oftentimes, it, it, all of those letters ended up getting uh, lost in the sea of mail that were in these airplane hangars. So they really didn't know right away because they didn't know uh, necessarily, they didn't really have a system yet for uh, sorting through that mail and getting it and making sure, you know, finding out if that, that soldier was deceased yet, or, you know, or not. So this was part of their task. Um, with all of that mail that and going through that and finding out, um, you know, who had, in fact, over those two years that this backlog had occurred, uh, was in fact deceased. Uh, so certainly part of their uh, job there. Um, yes, very proud of these women and their contribution. Uh, we agree with that. Um, and we have a comment here. Thank you to these African-American women who served in these menial yet important tasks despite their educational accomplishment and did an incredible job. Absolutely. They certainly did. And as I, and I, as I can't say this enough, they took on a job where many others had failed. <laughs> they did. They just couldn't come up with a good system. These women came in and they figured it out and they made it happen and they did it in half the time. So uh, pretty incredible. So a story that we definitely need to remember. And again, just a story that reminds us that um, before the civil rights movement, uh, there were these little acts of resistance that were happening throughout. Um, and long before the civil rights movement took hold, that you see that in World War II. And I think it's something that these women uh, would certainly remember. Uh, so uh, their accomplishments are incredible. Uh, again, Brenda Moore's book um, is To Serve My Country, To Serve My Race. And if you want to delve really uh, much deeper into their story. It's a fascinating look into their lives and what they did afterwards as well. And uh, there's also one, especially for younger people, um, that I really like. It's called Standing Up Against Hate. Uh, that's by Mary Cronk Farrell. Um, and particularly if uh, young women learning more about these incredible women, this is a great book because it's um, just a uh, uh, easy, easy read, a quick read, but really sums up their story beautifully. So I can't uh, recommend those two books enough. Wonderful. Um, so um, I don't think we have any more questions. I think that sums up uh, a little bit of the story of the 6888, and I hope you've enjoyed um, hearing about their accomplishments. And do hope you'll join us for our future lectures coming up. Check our website, dday.org, for more information. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time.